the Epic of Gilgamesh, unknown author. This is in the philosophy section. To me, the Epic of Gilgamesh comes across as a creation myth of sorts, an allegory with moral undertones, and an archetypal psychological projection. At the very least, it's a simple prose form poem, somewhat primitive and underdeveloped in structure. However, the combinations of characters and events make for an entertaining read. We begin the journey with Gilgamesh, the king of Uruk, who's apparently part god and part man, and his frenemy, Enkidu, part animal, part man, who's, quote, born on the steppe, end quote, and runs with animals. Gilgamesh is a dick to his people and lets his city walls pretty much go to shit. Enkidu comes into a market, people seem to like him, and Gilgamesh gets all pissed because Enkidu is blocking his way into market. They drop them hands, so to speak, for a few rounds, then get tired, then they look at each other, and in the eyes of Gilgamesh, quote, saw himself in the other, just as Enkidu saw himself in Gilgamesh, end quote. Everyone's all like, what's going on? Gilgamesh and Enkidu have a laugh and hug like good old boys. Gilgamesh talks Enkidu into fighting a creature named Humbaba in the forest, and they agree and venture out. They fight Humbaba and defeat it, but not before Enkidu gets his shoulder all jacked up with a wound. A goddess named Ishtar, the goddess of war, peace, and fruitfulness, comes out and tries to marry Gilgamesh. He all na yuaho. He actually says, quote, your love brings only war. You are an old fat whore. End quote. Not kind words. She's hurt by this, so she sends down the bull of heaven to kill them. But Gilgamesh and Enkidu aren't phased by this nonsense either. They defeat the bull. Enkidu is still hurt, though, and getting worse from his shoulder wound. He slowly inches toward death and whispers, quote, Everything had life to me, the sky, the storm, the earth, water, wandering, the moon and its three children, salt. Even my hand had life. It's gone. It's gone. End quote. Enkidu dies, a little bit of a drama queen, but he seemed fun, life of the party kind of guy. Gilgamesh is stricken with grief, so he wanders into the desert and mountains and travels beyond a gate guarded by scorpion people. Gilgamesh wants to talk to his father, Upnapishtim, across the Sea of Death about bringing Enkidu back to life, but he can't seem to find him. He meets a barmaid named Suduri, who tells him he needs to find a boatman named Urshanabi to shepherd him across a river to the sea. The only way to find this dude is by following some stones with images on them. Gilgamesh smashes some of these stones, for unknown reasons really, other than smashing stuff is fun. And he, he seems like he's still mad about Enkidu, I guess. Um, so he smashes these stones right before he finds Urshanabi. Then Urshanabi promptly explains, quote, You have destroyed the sacred stones that might have taken you across. End quote. Poor form, Gilgamesh. But Urshanabi explains another way. Urshanabi tells him to use his axe and cut down a boatload of trees to make poles so he can push himself out of a channel and into the sea of death. Alternate approach number one is successful and Gilgamesh sails across the sea to find his father on the opposite shore. His father instantly starts spouting some whack wisdom and stories and overall seems pretty happy to have a little company after only hanging with his old wife for many years. Gilgamesh asks his father for something to bring Enkidu back to life, but his father gets all pissed at this question and tells Gilgamesh to bugger off. Upnapishtim's wife tells him to ease it up and help his son. He ponders for a bit, then offers this. I will tell you a secret I have never told. There is a plant in the river. Its thorns will prick your hands as a road thorn pricks, but it will give to you new life, end quote. Gilgamesh ties stones to his feet and wades into the water to procure the plant. He thanks his father, then carries on back across the sea of death 
to the other shoreline and takes a rest. The plant is unattended for a moment. A snake sneaks up and eats it, sheds its skin, then bounces out. Gilgamesh grieves heavily since he knows now his friend is lost for good, and he promptly returns to Uruk. He asked a blind man if he's ever heard of Enkidu. The blind man, quote, shrugged and shook his head, end quote. Gilgamesh then looks up at his walls, quote, awed at the heights his people had achieved, and for a moment, just a moment, all that lay behind him passed from view, end quote. So, who were these characters and what are we supposed to make of them? As I read these passages, images from other later stories emerged. Genesis starts with Adam and Eve in a walled garden. Uruk is a walled city. We can view the wall as the archetype of order. Gilgamesh is the ruler of Uruk or ruler of order. He is the father. But Gilgamesh is cruel to his people and his walls, city walls are crumbling. He is the tyrannical father in the archetypal sense. And Kidu lives outside the walls and represents Mother Nature and renewal. When they meet, they initially fight in a kind of tussle between the mother and father, the young and the old, the new and the tired. They realize the need for each other and quickly become friends. Humbaba embodies the external threat to society. It's the chaos outside the wall that breaks apart the balance between Gilgamesh and Enkidu and the young and the old. <clears throat> when Enkidu succumbs to his wounds, Gilgamesh is left without his friend. The new, the young, and the innocent is gone, and Gilgamesh wants to bring it back. He must cross the sea of death to renew his friend's life, but is ultimately denied the chance when a snake eats the plant he obtained to bring Enkidu back. The attachment to his friend is cut short by the snake, a representation of chaos. Here, we see that chaos can rear its head at any time, rendering our actions moot through disorder. Gilgamesh wants his grief to subside by bringing his friend back, but the chaos of the snake denies him. In the end, he's left with his city, which has renewed itself without his tyrannical oversight. The story is read as a fight between order and chaos and a reconciliation of the old and the new in order for Gilgamesh to become renewed again, which manifests in the city during his absence from Uruk, he must venture out into a world where chaos exerts its spontaneous and destructive force by first becoming attached to Enkidu and then through losing him and his ensuing grief that follows, Gilgamesh integrates the innocent and new the wild and the free that Enkidu represented. In the end, he rejoins his city of Uruk as a complete integrated person, the loss of Enkidu fa fading from his memory as the reconstructed walls and his psyche meet again renewed. Summary. Short and enjoyable creation myth archetypal story of sorts with intriguing insight into ancient Mesopotamian psychology. Rating, 7.0. That review was done on August 27th, 2017.